If you just took this main body and you pushed it down the freeway at 70 miles an hour, it would virtually have no air resistance. Today, we'll take you inside Aptera HQ with its CEO and co-founder for an in-depth look like you've never seen. Let's hope I don't get an OMFG moment. Oh my God. Electric vehicles are up 30% a quarter, and the press is saying, oh, electric vehicles are dead. No, it's just Tesla's crushing everybody else. We'll bring our friend Matt, who happens to be an investor, to ask all the hard-hitting questions. So oh, when's promise. that really gonna happen? When's the delivery? And we'll even take this 1,000-mile range solar-powered EV on a drive. So let's get started. What attracted me to Tesla is what attracts me to this. If you haven't watched our previous video with Aptera, I'll link that here. But they've designed one of the most efficient, compelling, and affordable solar-powered EVs in the world and have nearly 50,000 people eagerly waiting for delivery. One of them, Matt, longtime EV owner and an accelerator investor. These guys know I bugged the crap out of them about solar. Yeah. I'm like, come on, Elon. I know it doesn't contribute a lot, but just do something. Like, you know, vampire drain, whatever. You guys well, are really- I'll show you later, but the way everybody else does it, it also adds a lot of weight. But we came up with really lightweight solar. It adds less than eight pounds to the whole vehicle. Wow. You get okay. 700 watts of power. 700 watts of power for a vehicle that only uses 100 watt hours per mile is pretty significant. Matt's launch edition Aptera will house a 45 kilowatt hour battery pack, good enough for over 400 miles of range. But the beautiful part is that you may never have to charge it. So we thought it'd be neat to bring Matt with us today to check in on his investment and kind of give you that side of the picture so you can and get, we'll get your take at the end of this yeah. on if you want to invest more or where, yeah. how you feel about it. Well, I'm clearly super excited about the car. Um, I think it's very creative. I like the innovation that's going into it. But now I have money into it. I want to make sure these guys are legit. I want to see the factory. I want to, you know, see like, you know, meet the meet some of the people. And so it's worth the the, the the trip out here to kind of uh, get a little bit of peace of mind in terms of you know the operation and all that kind of thing. Now this video isn't sponsored by Aptera, but it is sponsored by Fantic, the brand that makes some of my favorite products in my garage. Between the kids, the bikes, the balls, we use our smaller inflator almost weekly, but check out Fantic's new flagship item. This is the X9 Ultra. It's made for larger cars, Jeeps, and trucks. So Fantic makes some really cool stuff, but I feel like the X9 Ultra really tops the cake. It has a 45 inch inflation hose so you're able to reach those larger cars and all the accessories are built in and right here so you're not scrambling to find them it's also three in one so you have two USB C's and a USB A and a flashlight that's built right into it it can quickly inflate large tires like the f-150 Raptor from 30 to 35 psi in less than 40 seconds or from zero to 35 PSI in about four minutes. It's six times faster than the competition, and of course, it comes with a digital gauge. I love that it is a reliable power station, so you have 2,500 milliamp hours of power on board. I'm able to charge my laptop. And check this out. You can see how much power it's drawing, and I can charge my phone at the same time. If you're ever out camping and you need a bright light or an emergency feature, it's all right here. To get yours, check out the link in the description below, or you can find them on Amazon. And by using our links, you're also helping out this channel. But let's get back to the video. Design is, is you know, kind of off the charts. It's a mathematical yeah. solution to the problem of aerodynamics and yeah. transportation. Aptera's incredible efficiency allows its integrated solar to provide up to 40 miles of free driving range every single day. All because the simple fact that every square inch of this EV has been crafted to be mathematically the most efficient design possible. If you just took this main body and you pushed it down the freeway at 70 miles an hour, it would virtually have no air resistance. You know, you go from a 40 mile per gallon to 355 miles per gallon, which is what we get. If you make it super aerodynamic, if you make it super lightweight, if you have a super efficient powertrain, people don't realize when you burn gasoline, you only get about 25% of the energy out of your fuel to your wheels. Electric vehicles are a lot better. They get about 80% of the energy from the wall to the wheels. We take that up to about 90%. All the air resistance really happens at the wheels. We wish we could make the Aptera float. It doesn't. <laughs> Uh, but as the tire touches the ground, there's a high pressure zone in front of this tire that you just can't get rid of. It's most of the drag product. This is kind of a hump, like in a fish. And we found that fish swimming close to the seafloor actually put a hump in their back because it decreases their hydrodynamic resistance to the water. So fish learned this millions of years ago. It took the computer to tell us how to do it. But if you put a hump in the back, you actually speed up the air towards the rear of the vehicle. And you're basically sucking the high pressure zone 
out from the wheels and the nose of the vehicle. Last summer, Eptera achieved the lowest coefficient drag of any vehicle ever tested at 0.15, making it a remarkable 46% more efficient than the new Model 3. The problem with most vehicles today is you're driving a brick down the road. There's a big high pressure zone in front of your nose. It has nowhere to go. So all of your resistance is accumulated right at the nose of the vehicle. It has nowhere to go. Here, we have a little high pressure zone in front of the nose, but we speed up the air towards the rear, and that vacuum effect basically neutralizes all the pressure that the front of the vehicle sees. And then you streamline it all the way to the tail and you let the air converge back towards the rear of the vehicle. When it's going through the air, it's basically like nothing ever happened. You leave as little wake as possible behind you. And that means you just use very little energy aerodynamically to push this vehicle down the road. You know, we use in-wheel motors because we can tune them very specifically to highway driving. And we can move the mass of the vehicle out to the wheels versus having it in the center of the vehicle. This is what the in-wheel motors look like oh. when, the, when the tire's not on. Oh, I love this stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay. So the, there's a magnet ring that goes around here. And uh, that's basically the rotor now and the stators on the inside. Uh, so because this is such a big lever arm now, you got a 14 inch motor versus an eight inch motor, you just get a lot of leverage from that magnet ring. So that's how we get our big torque and able to do zero to 60 so quick. Uh, but also we, it's really tunable because basically it's the windings of the motor that mm -hmm. tune it for efficiency at highway speeds. And we've really come up with something pretty great with the Lafay in Slovenia. So the, the, tire go, the tire and rim goes over it and you take it off just like a regular tire and rim. So that's the tire and rim back there. But if you, uh, if you go to like discount tire or something, you, they take it off just like a regular tire. They won't know. Notice little, any different? They might be a little bit confused the first time. <laughs> they'll, they'll definitely be confused, but you tell them, oh, it's just regular lug nuts, just take it off. It's much bigger. It's about 14 inches versus other electric motors, which are only maybe six or eight inches big. So we get a lot more leverage in the motor too. So that's why we're so nimble and quick. So zero to 60 in four seconds, um, you know, very spirited driving, top speed around hundred miles an hour. Um, it's really because of the size of that motor. It's so big, it's really torquey. We redesigned this a little bit since Gamma. So it looks a little more natural, uh, the smile shape, but uh, this is a sense of ostensibly the Aptera smile or the Aptera smirk, um, oh, as funny. some people call it. It is, definitely. And then if you, if you have a 350 mile per gallon equivalent vehicle, something that's so efficient, it uses less than 100 watt hours per mile, then you can do cool stuff like the solar panels. So solar on the hood, solar on the dash, solar on the roof, solar on the rear hatch. You put those four panels together, you get about 700 watts of solar power production. Uh, over the course of a day of, uh, of Southern California sun, you can put more than 40 miles of energy back into your tank. There's other parts of America, New Mexico, that has even better insulation, so you could do even a little better uh, in places like that. But if you aggregate that, that's about 11,000 miles a year of free driving just from the solar power uh, that you get from the vehicle. And that's in Southern California, so we get more sun here. But in drearier places like Seattle, Boston, New York, Germany, uh, you'll still get about 8,000 miles a year of driving just from your solar. So uh, still terribly useful in places that don't get as much sun. Inside, all parts have been optimized for record efficiency without jeopardizing safety features often found in supercars, like a carbon fiber monocoque, but with a $33,000 EV for its launch edition. Like a modern seat with all its accoutrement, like power stuff, you know, it could be like almost 40 pounds just for a seat. What is the weight? And our seats are six pounds. So every 30 pounds of weight you add to the vehicle, you lose a percent of range. How much does the whole thing weigh? The whole thing, the launch edition for 400 miles of range weighs about 2,200 pounds. So the cross car beam that holds the dash and everything has really been light weighted. We lowered all the metal part weight by like 60% by just using generative AI design. We can give the computer problems of this hinge needs to take these loads and move in this way. How can we take weight out? And the computer basically feeds back a solution and says, well, you can take weight out here and it doesn't reduce the, the stresses. And so that's what allows you to keep all the safety, even with a car that's really, really light. You know, the Formula One cars have extreme safety, 220 mile an hour accidents and the driver walks away because they're surrounded by a safety cell. That's what we do. We've got a carbon fiber safety cell that surrounds you. And that gave us the highest roof crush strength of any passenger car on the road last time we tested it. So really strong composite structures, great side impact protection. So we've got this big solid uh, boxed out beam. Oh, makes knock, it a knock the knock knock sensor. You know, it's about making the vehicle strong in some areas and divert kinetic energy into other areas. So you got two crush rails in the front, directs all the energy down into the battery pack. 
You get in a rear impact or frontal impact, it's driving all of the kinetic energy to the heaviest thing in the vehicle, the battery pack. A bit over 650 millimeters of crushable space in the front and you need 650 millimeters to get a five-star crash rating in the U.S. So we look forward to the next three months probably. We'll get our first production intent builds here. We'll start to do crash testing. We'll show people video of that, you know, show them how well it does and how, how cool it is to, to drive something that's efficient and safe and fun. Technically, it's considered more a motorcycle. It is considered a motorcycle. That's why you have the four inch plate in the back. Uh, but because you have something over your head, you don't have to wear a helmet. Yeah. Um, and because it's three wheels, you don't have to have a motorcycle's license. But you get to buy motorcycle insurance, which is much cheaper than traditional automobile insurance. Yeah. So less insurance, less on your gas bill or electric bill, um, and something that we think is uh, just pretty cool and fun to drive. Yeah, I think it's so cool. It's so innovative. Like you've really had to develop everything new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's nothing like this. You're about to see one of the most transparent discussions as Chris gave us a private tour of their 77,000 square foot facility near San Diego, providing insights into the incredible engineering behind this one of a kind EV. This facility is capable of making about 20,000 vehicles a year, 10,000 vehicles a shift. The problem after 20,000 vehicles is the logistics of getting trucks in and out of here. Uh, it's a bit of pain in the butt. But uh, you'll see over here, this is our electrical engineering section. We do low voltage, high voltage solar charge controller. But you'll see a blue line that goes around the exterior here on this side of the building. That is the vehicle assembly line. And there's 12 stations that go along that line. So we build solar panels and battery packs here and that feeds the assembly line for the vehicles. Every shift can do about 40 vehicles per shift. So we gotta make 40 battery packs in the shift. We gotta make 40 sets of solar panels and that feeds the line. If you add a second shift, you get up to 80 vehicles a day. That's about 20,000 vehicles a year. This is actually the full process to build the Aptera. We start the vehicle with a battery pack because that's the heaviest piece of the vehicle. And we add the rear suspension, then we come over here, we add the front suspension and the monocoque body structure. These 12 stations have a tack time of 12 minutes each. So in just a couple hours, you have a full Aptera build and it's ready to head off to a to one of our 47,000 reservation holders now. Monroe and Associates is really integral in helping us kind of set up the vision for manufacturing. We didn't want to design the most efficient vehicle in the world, but then have a terribly inefficient manufacturing mm -hmm. process. So when I look at it like this, it seems very simple. Like it's, it is relatively it, simple, yeah. We build in sub-assemblies, so we put a lot of the work onto our supply chain. You know, the body structures come here as one unit. The front suspension clip, the rear suspension clip comes here as one unit. They're all in boxes back there. We bring them out. We put the front suspension on, six bolts, a couple connectors, a fluid connector. It's done. I don't know if I showed you last time we, we, we talked uh, up north, but these are actually our solar cells. And the cool thing about them is they have this copper matrix on the back that holds them together. It's called an IBC cell. And even though this is a monocrystalline cell, it still has pretty good flexibility. Mm -hmm. So we're able to actually flex the cell about a millimeter and a half on each corner. And that gives us the compound curved shapes that we get um, out of the vehicle. But, I feel yeah. that, wow. And the efficiency you're Super lightweight. That? So about 24%, lightweight. 24.2, 24.3. It feels like a piece of like tin foil or something. Very, very lightweight. Do you gonna feel it? So did you guys design these specifically? For um, Maxion makes our cells. They're actually made in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, they used to be sole provider to a company called SunPower and they made lots of cells. Um, but uh, another interesting thing is that uh, because of this copper matrix yeah. on the back, if you break a cell, it's actually still held together by the copper matrix on the back and it's still producing power. So if you get a strike that, uh, that has some micro cracking in the cell or even like you could shoot a bullet through it, um, it'll still be producing power. Uh, other cells, the old types of monocrystalline cells, they were only attached on the sides electrically. So anytime you broke the crystal, you killed all electrical connectivity. So not only do you not kill it completely for this cell, but it also doesn't affect the other ones around it. Yeah, the yeah. problem with the old style cells Cereal. is if you, if you break one, you turn it into a resistor. And yeah. you can kind of push power through them sometimes, but it basically kills your whole panel. So one panel okay. breaks, you kill your whole panel. So sort of like the old Christmas lights, one of them goes yeah. out and yeah. then the whole yeah. thing goes out. All of our panels okay. are replaceable and upgradable. Because what we hope is that in 10 years, these are 40% efficient, yeah. not 23% oh, yeah. efficient. The question is so. like easy upgradability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so if somebody, where do you see this? I guess right now, these aren't available, but if when they are, 
um, as far as service goes, how does how would that work with the consumers? Um, you know, we are going to have mobile service to start. So if you're in a high population density, if you're in Atlanta, San Francisco, San Diego, Houston, Austin, you're probably going to have a, a service van that can come out to you and service right. it. Uh, if you live in the middle. One of my big questions in Georgia, yeah. you guys are here. And if I get like, you know, the first one or 10 vehicles that come out, like how, you know, something. Well, the first step in a great service plan is not having your product break. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so having a really simple product that's very robust, you know, electric vehicles are 10 times more reliable than combustion yeah. vehicles. We take it to kind of the next level. We have a very simple vehicle. Everything's built in modules, so it's kind of easy to replace. So we hope that the service needs will be very, very low. And if somebody that if somebody lives in the middle of Australia, like you know, hundreds of miles away from anybody, mm -hmm. we'll still ship you a part if you need one. So we have a we have this right to repair mentality yeah. that if you need something, we'll give it to you and we'll tell you how to fix it. Yeah. So we'll send you a video link that shows you like this is how you take the part out, this is how you put in the new I part. I love that. Uh, we're, we're looking That's to add right, QR yeah. codes to the parts so you can just scan them with your phone and it'll take you to a video link and information link so you can. So you can I think have all that is huge that because is I think That's about companies like Tesla where you can't just like take it to a shop like you're like oh, okay I can't just like go to like a manufacturer but with you guys you're like hey you can fix it yourself or take it to somebody anybody take it to a local mechanic yeah. say, even yeah, like the Maytag or, repairman could help you out yeah your service that way yeah. because you know Kim's not gonna sit here and replace one of the roof panels I might but, <laughs> there we go. Uh, right, right, video. No, but, um, yeah, it's a much more open source mentality that, hey, we want your vehicle to stay on the road. We don't have an interest in the service model, just like charging the vehicle. We don't have an interest in the charging infrastructure. We don't have an interest in making money on the service. We have an interest in keeping your vehicle on the road and using less energy than every other vehicle around you. That, that's yeah. our mission. We want to make the world a cleaner, brighter place long term by using less energy for transportation, by getting all your power from the sun, mm -hmm. and by spending less money you know, on the fuel you need. When you actually make the panel, you have the choice to either see the interconnect or you can black it out so you don't see it. Uh, we think we're going to show it off. I kind of like it. Kind of cool. Yeah, I like well, it. Well, especially being a shiny, nice copper look to it. You know, uh, it's probably going to be tinned so it'll look silver. Oh, okay. So that goes better with the black yeah. backing, we think, and it's yeah. a little, uh, a little more know. lovable. But we use uh, very thin, lightweight glass. Uh, it's much like the glass on your cell phone. It's really scratch resistant, but really lightweight. And that is still technical glass. And from this, we lighten things up, you know, about 80% until you get to really lightweight panels like this, which is, you know, the same roof panel as that, but much, much lighter. One of the things that comes to mind is why not manufacture pieces like this that, you, that um, other electric vehicles could, you know, potentially add to Put one hand underneath it. Feel how lightweight it is. Oh wow! Like, could you add this to like a Tesla? Yeah. yeah. And then make the Tesla a solar-powered vehicle? We could. It just wouldn't get you as far because the Teslas use much more energy than this. Okay. So for the same 3.2 square meters, you would only get maybe four to six miles a day in most okay. other electric vehicles. Where you guys can get 40 miles a day off of just yeah. off just the sun, Hold which it. is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, would help with the, all the phantom drain and all that kind of junk. But, yeah, um, some of the accessories. But this is about a 100, 120 watt panel, mm. depending, on, depending on sun. But it's hard to think that this is glass. You know, something it this doesn't. flexible. It feels very like, plastic. But it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's, uh, glass. it's actual glass. That's great. That's and fantastic. it's super strong and super scratch resistant and you know, everything we need to do. That is good. You know, I sat on the roof of the Rivian and I cracked it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that glass is like, not oh. that durable. <laughs> yeah. A friend's Rivian. A friend's Rivian, not his. Should definitely Another be able to friend. stand on the, should definitely be able to stand on the roof. <laughs> we have the first body structure over in Paris and it shows off all of these panels and that panel just gets bonded to this undercarriage. This is actually the carbon fiber SMC that underlays that so uh, carbon was... fiber SMC and then this is glass SMC. So I don't know if you remember a company called Saturn back in the day. Yeah, I do. Uh, but you remember people, they had commercials where people were hitting their cars with sledgehammers and driving stuff into the side like. The Saturn Ion with dent resistant side panels. But it was because it was an early version of this SMC process. It's gotten a lot better and stronger now. But you can take a, you can take a sledgehammer to the side of an Aptera, production Aptera and it'll be just fine. I keep thinking wow. about Cybertruck and all these videos we're seeing about like people like smashing the side of the Cybertruck, but you could do that with that Terra as well. The cool thing is you won't leave a dent in ours. It'll just bounce back. 
Yeah. And I like the stainless steel. Oh, yeah. Or, and it won't rust. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. It doesn't really rust. Um, a cool, a cool thing we've done too <laughs> is um, we don't paint our vehicles. We just put a film wrap on them. So you've seen a lot of the cyber trucks coming mm -hmm. out. People put pink wraps or blue wraps or whatever. Um, all of our vehicles come out looking like this, and then we just put a wrap on them. You can do uh, you can do white, you can do uh, flat black, or you can do kind of a silver. We call this uh, Soul Noir and Luna. And that's effectively just part of the purchase price of the vehicle. You get that. Yeah, it's and it's a uh, it's not a crazy amount of material. It's only like 300 bucks of material. So then it's just a labor to put it on. So another thing about our kind of right to repair and open source mentality is we'll actually send you the cut file for this. So if you want to go to a local printer, you can have them cut the pattern mm -hmm. and put it on. And that's what takes the guys so long is they don't have the pattern to put on these custom vehicles. Yeah. So they have to cut everything. So they waste a lot of material. So we'll send you the cut file. Yeah, you, you can print your uh, Hello Kitty or, uh, or Gucci print. Put it on the side of your Aptera. Yeah. Um, but well, good uh, for yeah, business cars and advertising. Exactly. Like I can see a lot of like real estate agents or whatever. Like, Want to get noticed? That. Drive around in a solar-powered spaceship. You know, with your logo. For on the sure. Side. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Like and subscribe. We use a cell called a 2170 cell. This is what's in the Tesla Model 3 and Model Y. But it's uh, it's 21 millimeters in diameter, and it's 70 millimeters tall. So when you hear Tesla talk about 4680s, mm -hmm. that means that it's 46 millimeters in diameter and 80 millimeters tall. So we do something a little different when we build bigger battery packs. We make the cell taller. So we have a 90 millimeter tall cell and a 120 millimeter tall cell. And that gives you a lot more energy density per cell. We're able to pack a lot more energy. You know, in so a how given many area. cells are in there then? 2,900-ish in our standard pack. And they're all packed into modules like this. This is what it looks like when it's all you know, wire bonded together and ready okay. to be put in a vehicle and this is very much the same way that tesla does like the model y packs it's model cool though packs. to see it like this in this yeah. stage because you know most people have never seen what it looks like because it's you can't really see it inside of your tesla yeah. right it's yeah. all covered up something sandy monroe and monroe and associates told us was you know um, harmonize as many parts as you can yeah and that'll help you you know if you have any any variations between models so so how many different variants you guys have in terms of mileage they'll be the 250 400 600 thousand you could see us maybe changing the lower range one to a low to even lower range because the most expensive part of the uptera is the battery pack so if we wanted to sell a sub $20,000 Aptera, it'd probably be with like 150, 200 mile pack. You know, cell costs are coming down, they're getting better. So it may, it may be a function of just better batteries allow us to have a smaller battery well, Which would actually be pack. very reasonable for the commuter folks. That's what I was going to say is a lot of times you're not really, you know, you're just using it to commute. The average person, I think, drives like 35 miles a day in the U.S. And even just a 110 charge will pump, yeah. pump that thing up in reasonable period. You get 150 miles overnight of 110. Yeah. charge. Our most popular vehicle by far is the 400 mile range. So we think 600 has its place, but uh, the 1,000 mile range is actually our lowest ordered vehicle. So it's like 8% of our orders. How fast did you say that you can charge? Uh, 500 miles an hour. So, you know, if you stop for a half an hour, you get 250 miles or so. That's in the launch edition. We In the future, you know, we'll get it to be faster, but, you know, the easy path for us now is 50 kilowatts. Keeps everything simple, keeps all the parts really lightweight. And then once they're in a form, like this is a hood, then the robot will pick up this whole assembly and then put it on top of glass. And then that gets put into the forming machine and gets all melted, heat pressed together. If I want to add more like third party cell, uh, you know, solar things, it's very easy to just run in this and, and generate more power for it. And you guys well, have something like that? It was something similar. We have a uh, headroom in our solar charge controller, so you can add another thousand to 1500 watts of solar, so. Okay, you so can, if you're camping, you can pretty easily throw in more and... Yeah, tri triple your energy production while you're camped. Yeah. Get, you know, over 100 miles a day of solar charge back right. in your vehicle. Without having to jimmy rig the whole thing, you just sort of make a, a fairly easy plug and play. So is the battery and the electricity on there, is that like bi-directional? So could you... We, we don't have bi-directional capability right now, but we're working on it. You know, we're still nine months plus away from, from real volume production. So we think we have a good amount of time to... To sort through some of that stuff but we want it to be bi-directional we want you to be able to feed back to the house there's not a lot of easy systems to do that with though they're they're not commoditized yet so they're in the thousands of dollars to add something to your house to put put power back to your house we want something that's really simple you know like a 48 volt link or a 12 volt link you know something that's really easy and cheap to get power back to your power wall or whatever you have at your house so you can use it for other stuff this is the panel destructive test 
<laughs> it's a one meter ball drop test, but it's a steel ball, much like they use for the Cybertruck. But we, uh, we oh, test wow. a lot of these panels. And you'll see on this table over here, we have tons of coupons and in the racks we do, but we've done hundreds and of, of different material categorizations. And then you do the drop test. And you, all right, let's hope I don't get an OMFG moment right now. So you put it through here? Put it through here. And then pull that pin. Okay. You're now you're now part of the Aptera Solar Testing Team. All right. So how much would that does that simulate, Chris? Like like the impact, the the heaviness of that ball with that drop. Uh, the idea is, is it's to simulate you know the heaviest things that could typically hit your vehicle: softball, hail, yeah, that type of stuff. Okay. Um, so that's about the max that that estimates probably approximately the max that could ever hit your car. Yeah, the standard test for solar panels is what we have over here in this green box. It's uh, it's an ice ball test. So you shoot a one inch ice ball at it, 90 miles an hour, and if it passes, it passes. So can we do that? Today? But is that? Yeah, well, we can look at it. I don't think we have any ice frozen up for you. We put the ice ball in there and then shoot it out. I don't think we have. We usually keep the ice balls in that little freezer over there, and I don't see any. So if it passes that test and passes the drop test and. You know, the uh, temperature cycling, we have a UV chamber on that, that wall over there. So we put, uh, we put a panel in there and it gives it up to 10 years of UV in like three days. And we have a temperature cycler over there that'll give it 10 years of temperature cycling durability. I think it takes like a week though. Shake and vibe, we have to send them out to a lab and they put it on a table and it shakes it around for, for a while. Most of this is just challenges no other solar company has faced. You know, how do you put solar panels onto an automotive vehicle that needs shake and vibe. And we've definitely uncovered problems that you know, nobody else has fought. Mm -hmm. The solar plane that flew around the world, the solar impulse, uh, those are the people we reached out to first. We're like, we're trying to do this solar, you know, curved solar panels. And you guys did this, you know, five or six years ago with this plane that flew around the world. And, uh, you know, we'd like to learn from what you did. And we contacted those guys and they're like, yeah, it only had to last for like two weeks flying around the <laughs> around the world and then and then everything just went to shit so like it had no durability built into it like they were just like no we just got the cells on there to stick and electrically connected and then flew it around the world we, there was no thought about how to make it last for 10 years so it was when just... did when did Aptera first start like as the idea as opposed to where we are now well I met Steve in 2005 and uh, he had an idea for a super efficient vehicle that could get into the carpool lane um he thought that aerodynamics was kind of the big reason why other vehicles just got shitty fuel economy. You look at like a VW Bug, you know, why does it only get like 35, 40 miles a gallon? Like it's curvy and stuff, right? It's lightweight, uh, but it's really aerodynamics first. And then it's how heavy the vehicle is. And then it's how efficient the powertrain is. So it's really just solving all those pieces of where does the energy go in transportation. And uh, we started that in 2005. And uh, I had my boat company, so I was doing this cool composite stuff, resin infusion, making lightweight composite structures really strong. And uh, Steve and I were just kindred spirits, so we uh, kind of held hands and started the first Aptera and got a good bit of notoriety and got on the cover of Popular Science Magazine and, and got a little money and started taking pre-orders and ramping the mm -hmm. vehicle up. But there was no EV industry, so... You know, um, there was no DC to DC converters or even the charge inlets hadn't been set yet. The J1772 and NACs didn't exist. So, um, you know, it was quite a large CapEx hurdle to get over. And uh, Elon, you know, fortunately had the financial means to solve those problems and vertically integrate and just bring those parts into existence. Uh, we did not. And the, uh, the economy going down in 2009 uh, pretty much put a, put a death nail um, in that first business plan, but uh, they liquidated. Uh, we left the company because they hired new management, and we didn't get along with the new management. They had a different vision for where they wanted to take the company. But they liquidated in 2011. Uh, we were able to reacquire the company in 2019, restart it. Now we've got a supply chain that can supply you know these parts. Now we've got a public that understands what electric vehicles are, um, so it's not a big stretch for them to think about. Oh, electric vehicles can be more efficient, and oh, you get a thousand miles. You know that's pretty cool. And solar had gotten a lot better in the last decade, too. So, you know, solar cells were like 15% efficient when we had the first Aptera. And then the revamp of the Aptera, 24% efficient cells. So now you can do a lot more with solar. You know, supply chain's there. Batteries are so much better. So it was kind of just the right time, I think, for us to, to jump back into the fray yeah, and uh, give yeah. people. Yeah. Perfect storm of components. 
And how did you come up with the name Aptera? Uh, Aptera is actually Greek for wingless flight. So we were, uh, we were just drinking whiskey and pontificating and one of Steve's engineering friends is a bit of a linguist, so. I was always really proud of like my Model 3 and Model Y because they get like, what, 120, 130 equivalent miles to the gallon, mm -hmm. I think. And you guys are 350. 350? Yeah. yeah. It's just off the chart. I mean, it's, it's, four, it's an order for, I mean, it's so much more. Um, obviously because of the crazy design and, and, and all the other capabilities and lightweight and whatnot, but that's just really impressive. That's just incredible. It's, um, it's interesting, you know, uh, the technology's out there. It's just who's going to put together all these pieces yeah. of the technology yeah. for one goal. And our goal is to make transportation more efficient. And we think that it has a trickle-down effect, people spending less money, you know, for their transportation. You can imagine, you know, um, economically distressed areas, economically distressed people uh, using the Aptera. And, you know, uh, families in America are now spending over $5,000 a year just on gasoline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you could give somebody transportation that's free, that's, that's, that's a big boon yeah. uh, to a lot of people. So, you know, people you cannot can relate to that. You know, they can fly like 350. Like, you know, you get, a, you understand your car gets 10, 20, 30 miles to a gallon. Yeah. And then suddenly you say, well, I got a car that for you that'll do 350. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's just unbelievable. Let's do that. Yeah. So that's why we have 47,000 orders, and now we just got to deliver. Yeah. So when's promise. that really going to happen? When's the delivery? Uh, we're hoping to start production by the end of this year, and we'll probably be delivering our first vehicles 2025. It's really a T-minus situation where we're raising oh. funding now, and as soon as we have the funding, we're able to stand up the line in Italy, stand up the line yeah. here. We're making slow, incremental progress with the money we have. We just finished our accelerator program. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate your support. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that accelerator program raised almost $35 million, and that's gone into, you know, finishing the design of the vehicle, finishing, you know, the manufacturability of the solar panels and working with companies like CTNS on the battery pack. Um, but to buy, like, the big tooling for, like, the injection molds for the seats and the dash and uh, the die-cast metal for the frame and the suspension members, uh, we haven't spent that money yet. Yeah. So as soon as we're able to spend it, then about nine months after that, how we're able to start production. How much do those molds cost? Um, you know, just the hard stuff. It's uh, it's kind of in the, the thirty-five million-ish range, just for the like the hard tools. So you know, we're we're, we're out there looking for you know around sixty, sixty-five million dollars to complete the production plan. That's my next question. And we yeah. uh, we've been working with some debt partners and some other stuff uh, on that. We think we'll have some exciting stuff to announce. Uh, in the next couple months and, you know, new strategic relationships and hopefully some new equity uh, path. So uh, debt, equity, equipment financing. So you're buying big pieces of equipment. There's companies that will finance that. So it'll be a blend. We're also still working on some grant stuff and some yeah. federal loan stuff. So that could that could come through in the long so haul. So if you show. could go back and tell yourself in 2005 something before you're at this journey, what would you go back and tell the younger version of, of you don't lose control of your cap table <laughs> if you're in a startup if you're in a startup and you give too much of your company away in the beginning then other people intrinsically control your destiny so luckily when we were able to reacquire reform the company in 2019 you know the founders of the company own 70 percent of the company uh the other stock we sell is non-voting stock so so we we make the decisions to push the company forward there's nobody else calling the shots you know, we're going to make the most efficient transportation. We're going to get this vehicle into production, and there's, there's kind of nobody standing in our way. And the funny thing about that comment is it's not about, like, how, you know, how much money they're going to make. It's more about who gets to call the shots. So it's the actual control. Right. Keep and keeping that original vision. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly think the Aptera of old could have survived to today and, and, and been producing vehicles and, you know, had a much brighter path once the EV industry got more established. And, um, you know, but it just didn't happen because we, we didn't have control of the cap table. The rear storage, maybe? Yeah. And the charge port back here, but Tesla charge port back here. And we've got our uh, rear view cameras back here. This is your backup camera. This is your rear view camera. This has been moved to the top of the hatch here. So there'll be one backup camera here so you can, like, see the curb or mm -hmm. something you're backing up on. What is and then there'll be a high view camera here. This yeah. is to light up the license plate. Oh. So there'll be lots of ways that you can modify, add, you know, go to the aftermarket to buy stuff for the Aptera 2, hopefully. The cool thing about us being more open source minded 
is that when aftermarket people that make cool stuff for cars and vehicles come to us, we'll just give them the CAD for like what the shape is and, and how to integrate it. We'll give them the schematic for how to you know plug into the electrical. You know, we'll, we'll, we want to help foster that. We want as many people making as many cool things for the Aptera as possible. Oh, I love that. Uh, you knock twice to get in the rear, knock twice to get into the sides. It authenticates your phone, so when you walk up, it knows it's you, and then you can knock on it. And, so and it when I talked to you last summer, you were like, I think we'll, we'll keep that in production. Are you so leaning to Yeah, people, knock, knock? people have really liked it. I, I didn't know, you know, if it would be something different, like you rub it or something, or, you know, there's just many different ways, you know. Um, Ford has a thing where you kick it, and, you know, but it seems like everybody really just likes the knock, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I like it. It's <laughs> not not who's there. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. But we, uh, as I said, we changed the rear a little. So th this is the factory end bezel, but the uh, the actual hatch now closes all the way over the rear. So uh, so getting in and out is a little bit different. We we hid this this hinge in here a little better, so we opened up the the rear room here. But if you fold the seats forward, I mean, this is basically a full size bed. And you can go camping, mm -hmm. two people and a dog can camp back here easily. Um, we added a storage bin right yeah. here that goes above your rear wheel so you can put the charging cables or anything in there. We've got uh, storage uh, for the side that we'll be able to add. So if people want to add little extra storage cubbies and stuff. Um, and fold the seats forward. There'll either be a flap that you can put down or something for your feet. But the idea is you keep your head back here and your feet that way. And then you control anything for the vehicle on your phone. Yeah, and you all have the view of the stars. Yeah. Thinking about taking this camping somewhere 200 miles away and then letting the sun recharge you over a week and actually coming back home with more energy in your Aptera than you left with. You know, this yeah. is the first adventure vehicle that creates its own fuel when it's out adventuring. So plug in your induction cooktop, run your laptop, edit your, edit your YouTube films. And, you know. Same thing for the doors. Knock on the side, it lets you in, but we have uh, uh, airbags, front and passenger, safety belts, um, you know, big screen. The screen actually got smaller in production. This is a 15.6 inch screen. It's got a bigger bezel on the bottom. We shrunk it to a 12.8 inch screen. It was a little overwhelming for the interior to have that big a screen. Um, and it, it, we raised it up a little bit to keep it out of your knee room and such like that. But uh, the vents actually for the air conditioning are around the center screen. So you'll adjust the vents side to side and up and down, but all the air comes out from the center screen. That's cool. There's a little side vent that does your defrost, but, but most of your air for the passengers comes out of the screen there, which is, which is kind of cool. The driver's side. The feed from the side view cameras are in front of the steering wheel. So when you're driving, you're looking forward to the road, but you have situational awareness of what's going on 180 degrees behind you. So you don't have to look to the side to figure out if somebody's beside you or behind you. Mm -hmm. You're driving, you're looking at the road, and you're seeing a sight picture in front of you. It's what fighter jets do for their heads-up display. You know, you want to be flying the plane, but you want to know everything that's going right. on around you. So. You can see your blind spot yeah. while you're driving. And then we have a, a rear view camera that's digital up there, so when you put it in reverse, it'll give you the reverse lines and stuff yeah. so, you can, so you can see that. But we, we try to keep the interior, you know, pretty standard. You know, we hope that anybody that's driven a Tesla Model 3 can get into the Aptera and be like, oh yeah, yeah, just like any other electric vehicle. As far as like the UI go, are you able to download different apps or have like Netflix or watch anything inside of? Yeah, there? we'll have we'll have all the standard stuff that you'd expect from from Tesla or Rivian or anything like that. Uh, we're doing Apple CarPlay integration in Android Auto, but. Uh, it, the programs to actually get it certified through Apple and Android are actually pretty long. So we don't know that we'll have them in the first launch delivery vehicles because Apple, you have to have a proprietary Apple chip in your, oh. in your computer. So Apple has to supply you that chip. They have to go through a bunch of testing to make sure you're worthy. Um, so, you know, that <laughs> may, that may take a while, but we want to have Apple CarPlay and, and Android Auto. YouTube? Yeah, YouTube and all those kind of, yeah, that, that's, that's easy, easy stuff. What so. about voice control? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we talked about voice and gesture control. So three fingers do something, you know, four fingers do something, that sort of stuff. So you have easy gesture control. Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard about that for like a year. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think we've diverted resources to the hardware side and we haven't really talked much more about the software side. You know, with production being about a year away, we kind of need to start 
pumping money into that stuff like six months before we get there. Okay. So we have it kind of architected, but we haven't really been working on finalizing anything yeah. you know, for that stuff right now. That, that, that'll come. And then it'll be it never, you know, we'll basically turn into a software company, you know, to support the vehicle long term. We'll have a bunch of people that are evolving the software and not many people evolving the hardware because the hardware is hopefully evergreen. You know, the shape of the vehicle is never going to change. It's, it's mathematically the most aerodynamic thing possible. You know, the suspension works and all that stuff. So you won't be doing a lot of mechanical engineering. You'll be doing a lot of software improvements. This is Soul um, and that's Luna. Uh, these were the Alpha Series vehicles, so the very okay. first ones we built. Um, so we, uh, we got our first 300000 in funding, and that got all the engineering really started. Then we got another $2 million, uh, from an early investor, Patrick Quilter, uh, an amazing guy who started Quilter Labs up north, but a, an audio expert in, in power amplification. But he helped us basically finish up these first three vehicles, and that gave us just the basis for you know testing and ergonomics and all these fun things that we learned about these vehicles. But we uh, we actually took this design and turned it into a beta design, which we increased the interior volume by about one percent, uh, but we actually decreased the total drag product by about six percent. So we're able to use generative um, uh, aerodynamic research to reshape some of the fairings, reshape the body. We lengthened the tail four inches, so it gave you more storage inside and squished it down. Uh, the real limit on the tail was just, this is a four inch license plate. So mm -hmm. now we, we lengthened the tail and it's four inches in cross section just then, so we can accommodate the, the license plate. And the chargers underneath here. Yeah, the chargers underneath here, this is, this is the old school one, so it's not okay. as pretty, but, uh, but the Tesla inlet has been on all of our vehicles since the start. Um, and that's what we've used to charge everything. Back the camera. production one is four inches long. Yeah, the production one is four inches longer, and the, ta the interior room is longer and wider. Uh, you can fit uh, basically a full-size bed in the back of Gamma. So this one, and you pointed this out earlier, has some of the solar on the back, where we noticed the one over here does not. So yeah, so we, cha we changed the tail section too, which Gamma isn't fully evolved, but the tail section actually goes all the way to the tail. So we're able to put more of these panels on this oh, panel. Okay. So the problem was these were, these, these were kind of... Uh, um, ostracized from the other community and when you only string six cells together it, it doesn't really work electrically so we were able to add those to the rear hatch and now this is just one big panel uh, and this panel alone is like 350 watts so this is the majority of your solar production um, in the field the cool thing about that too is uh, we're worried about you know getting in and out of the vehicle a lot that you would scratch this all up yeah. uh, but having the rear hatch close over this means that this is just exposed carbon fiber. You can scratch it up all you want, it won't look bad. Uh, your, do your dogs mm -hmm. can get in and out and you won't yeah. have to worry about scratching stuff. You can yeah. pull construction equipment or band equipment in and out, you won't have to worry about you know, doing any yeah, uh, right. damage. So we, we think the camping feature really caught on too, that you, know, you put a tent over this and it goes over the sides. You can use the sides as storage, but you're gonna get in and out of the back a lot. So. Well, that's great. I mean, that's why I was asking about the plug-in solar. So if you happen to be remote camping, no plugs, you can add that to it and then are you going to have a camping mode that's going to like keep the uh you know the hvac going you know to keep you hot or mm -hmm. cold all, you yep. know all throughout the night kind of thing like tesla's mm -hmm. camping mode yep wonderful um what about uh i know you said you test it with the different temperatures and the and the heat is there any kind of heat pump with it to make it more efficient? uh we wish we had a heat pump but it's another one of those high dollar items that if we had the money to develop a heat pump uh we could but it's kind of an 18 month lead time too. So okay. we just stuck with conventional um, uh, PTC heater and regular uh, conventional high voltage air compressor for the, for the cooling. Um, it simplifies everything. A heat pump is, is terribly complex <laughs> um, and it's not small. So okay. you, gotta have, you got a lot of different components that you gotta package. So, uh, but we do think heat pumps are the future. Uh, they're definitely way more efficient especially on the heat side. Uh, the heat side with PTC heaters, it's just a resistive heater basically, and they're just not very efficient. So in the winter, uh, you could be burning a, a thousand watts through your heater in the Aptera, driving down the freeway, using 1800 watts of power to drive down the freeway. So you're using more than half of your power just for your, <laughs> just yeah. your heater, uh, because you know they're so power consuming, so. Yeah, okay. Are the seats by any, or the steering wheel, are those heated? Uh, the seats have heat. We have not chosen to heat the steering wheel yet, though. We have gotten several requests, so. After we're done with validation, the next three or four months, I mean, there's, there's nothing left to do 
on the design of the vehicle. Like you, you go through validation and uh, durability testing and you'll find some things break or squeak or something and you'll have some iterative design changes through, through validation and durability testing. But then once that's done, I mean, that's the vehicle you're building. So then we can retask these guys and okay, now we get to work on fun stuff. Now you get to work on you know some of the creature comfort stuff. Now you get to you know make a crazy tent. Now you get to make you know extra electronic features and stuff um, before we start developing the next vehicle, which we probably won't do until this is solidly in production. So yeah. and is this um, shape you feel it's scalable? Like if you wanted to go to a four wheel car or a larger sedan, like you know we have future versions of this that I can show you. Can't show them publicly, but I can show yeah. you. And we uh, okay we can. Yeah, that'd show be great. you how that kind of translates into four wheels and more utility vehicles, even up to like mass transportation semi trucks. Oh, wow. Okay. I did get a chance to take this prototype on a test drive, and a lot like the Cybertruck, it was getting lots of eyes on the road. To my surprise, the three wheeler, which is as wide as an F 150 and as long as a Prius, was incredibly nimble, though the software and some driving characteristics were still very much in the prototype phase. So I don't think it's fair to analyze that aspect just yet. But you can bet I'll be one of the first to take Matt's Aptera out for a review, hopefully by this time next year. So, final thoughts. Is this what you thought coming here today? Like, do you feel like they're where you expected them to be? Yeah, I think I'm actually, um, I'm pretty encouraged. Uh, I think they've got, you know, they, they clearly have a lot more work to do getting um, the factory set up, but it sounds like they're, they're on the cusp of some really great things. So that's very encouraging from the investor point of view. Um, from the customer point of view, um, I think the car is fantastic. I love the, the different things. You know, it is a prototype, so as you got to drive it, I got to drive it. You know, there's a lot of spit and polish that it still needs, but I, it, it's, it's clear those guys are very in tune with that, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited to see what the production is going to, the production vehicle is going to be like. Um, so I'm encouraged. I mean, I'm not discouraged at all. I would definitely say this is um, something that's still uh, is very exciting. I'm excited about. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's so exciting to be here in the cusp of all this this innovation that's going on right now as far as the vehicles and solar and to see, you know, how the company started out and where it's at now and it's so yeah. close to actually being production ready. Um, it's a little bit hard, kind of impossible to judge um, driving the vehicle in this state. It's fun to be able to do it and see it and give you guys some of those visuals, but it's definitely not the same vehicle as you guys will be able to get, you know, a year or so from now. Yeah, I think too, um, just sort of being here and being around and thinking is, this feels like a really fun, I mean, on top of like potentially a great little commuter vehicle and whatnot, it feels like a fun adventure car. Like, you know, Rivian's done a great job kind of doing the Land Rover thing and being like the outdoors adventure thing. This feels like a fun adventure weekend car you, you take up, you know, with your spouse or, or, or significant other and you can you know, do some fun camping trips. It's not off road, of course. It's mm -hmm. not that kind of a thing, but it's still, you know, you can have the, it can charge itself. You can do camp mode. You could, you know, I could just see it as a really neat like weekend car on top of other things. Um, I mean, if it's not if it's not your day, daily driver, it could still be a, a fun adventure vehicle, not in a four wheel drive fashion, but still in a fun camping way. Yeah, definitely. And I will say something that was kind of cool I noticed, especially when you were driving, we were following you around, was the looks that people. I don't know if you realize that everybody driving next to you was like, oh, yeah. "What oh, yeah. is that looking?" And okay. it kind of reminded me of the Cybertruck because oh, yeah. that also is another vehicle that kind of, you know, everyone turns and is like, what is this? And Aptera has that same sort of feel to it. Yeah. So if you like that, if you like having that, you know, having something unique and new, this would be a vehicle no doubt, that yeah. I would recommend. Um, but let me know what you guys think about Aptera. If you are an investor, if you want to invest, let us know in the comments below. And thank you guys so much for watching.